The arms companies here have an insidious grip on communities and towns across Scotland, the same as we would find anywhere else in the UK. And while the Scottish Parliament may try to, to poorly conceal the, the close relationship it has with the industry, we are working to highlight and to stop the facilitation of this exploitation and the millions from the public purse that is poured into these multinational companies who profit from death and destruction like BE Systems and Raytheon, who we've heard about already this weekend. Um, in the session last night, we heard um, that weapons used in the Arab uprisings were built and sold here in the UK. We take a closer look at that. We look at Kemring Energetics, who are based in Ayrshire on the west coast of Scotland, and they were part of that. They were manufacturing tear gas that at that time was being exported to Egypt to fuel that repression, as well as receiving grants from Holyrood over the last few years. And I think that that is just one of dozens of similar examples of Scotland not just being a puppet in the UK's export of its colonial and imperialist agenda, but actively playing a part in it. So today you'll see my fellow fantastic panelists. We have Yasmin Lukman, a British Yemeni activist, Brian Simpson, an industrial organizer for Unite the Union, Stefan Schmidt, a activist and researcher, and also Kate Nevins, a facilitator and researcher who works with people in the Middle East. And they will be, They'll be taking us on a journey of not only looking at the research and the tools available for activists in Scotland and, and across the UK, but also what lessons we can learn from, from trade unions and why engaging defence workers and their community should be at the heart of our discussions around green transition and the future for the arms industry. And we'll also be looking at the importance of local activism. And as was mentioned by Anna Stavronakis earlier this afternoon, how we can move from a notion of sympathy um, sorry, for those on the receiving end of the weapons that we build here towards actual solidarity with those communities. And so we have, we have Brian Simpson, who is an industrial organiser for Unite the Union, and he's here in a personal capacity. He represents and supports workers across Scotland and provides legal knowledge, organising skills and collective confidence. We are so happy to have you here with us, Brian, and to have a trade union presence in this space. So please take it away. No, no build up at all there, Emma. Thanks for that um, introduction. As, as Stefan says, you know, as trade unionists, we need to have, as anti-imperialists and trade unionists, we need to have a collective industrial international um, strategy to tackle the arms trade. Um, but full disclosure at the beginning, I don't represent, um, shall we say, defence workers. So what I was wanting to focus on more was dispelling some of the common misconceptions that are put out there, frankly, by some leaders in the trade union movement around organised labour and the arms trade. And as Emma says, you know, how important it is to engage workers in the movement against it. Um, this kind of perceived false dichotomy that, that definitely exists in, in the minds of uh, the media in some ways, and as I say, in the minds of some uh, trade union uh, leaders, the idea that, that there's a false dichotomy between workers and imperialism, that, you know, the workerist model, which perpetuates the myth that workers don't care about anything other than their own short-term benefit. Of, of wages and conditions, but actually has been proven through the history of, of workers' movements and collective actions. Workers have always cared about the arms trade. They've always cared about bombs being dropped um, on working people ar around the world. Um, so I thought it would be helpful in a wee bit of a shot in the arm um, in, this, in this current climate to provide you with just a few examples. Many of you will, will, will have heard of them or, or um, know that they happened. A few examples around the world, world where workers have collectively tackled the cabal that is the global arms trade and they've won. They've, they've you know, uh, actions by the very rank and file of, of organised labour that stretches well beyond their wages and their conditions um, and it's actually saved thousands of lives um, around the world. Probably the most well-known one, uh, the one that I think hits home to um, people in Scotland and the UK is, is the example of the, the, the workers in the Rolls-Royce um, factory in East Kilbride um, who refused to work on the Chilean Air Force parts that were moving through uh, under Heath's um, government um, 
and they were being used to kill uh, civilians by the Pinochet dictatorship. They were used um, to overthrow the IND government. Um, but in a nutshell, this was workers coming together, you know, 50 years ago now, um, just a few miles down the road from where I am in the south side of Glasgow, um, who managed to disrupt one of the most notoriously vicious post-war regimes. Um, workers who, for all intents and purposes, could have been pigeonholed as workers who only cared about wages and conditions, but actually they were led by anti-imperialists. They were led by trade unionists who also made the link um, between what was going on in Latin America with what was being done to their wages here. Um, even those who um, might not have made those links, there, there was a lot of uh, detractors even within uh, the membership at the Rolls-Royce factory. Um, were soon educated. Uh, the union went about educating very quickly, very radically, the workforce who may not have agreed with the leadership, and I mean the, the, the rank and file leadership, the conveners who took the action. Um, but soon a, a consensus was developed, an anti-imperialist perspective was developed through a collective struggle. Um, I mean, the history of uh, dock workers taking collective action to stop the trade of weapons being used to kill civilians around the world is even uh, stronger and longer. Um, it was only in March 2017 um, that a, a fireman uh, called Ignacio Robles, I hope I'm saying that right, um, was em em employed by the port of Bilbao, refused to collaborate in the loading of the Barry vessel um, with arms that was going to Saudi Arabia. Um, he was disciplined, his employer tried to sack him, and over the course of the next year, a range of grassroots groups in Bilbao, including refugee rights organisations, um, Passage Sejoro and Onji Yatori, um, Greenpeace, local feminist movements, um, undertook a series of actions at the port, including uh, occupying the, the ships themselves. The, the tactics that they used, uh, essentially a port blockade, was quite a fitting one because, as, as folk will know, the Saudi blockade at the port of Hodeida um, and other measures have deprived much of Yemen's civilian population of, of basic necessities to live. Um, but as a result of the protests that started with that one worker refusing to take action, uh, Barry made the decision in 2018 in March to pull its business out of the port entirely. Um, these actions soon spread to France, where the CGT union, uh, the dock worker section, um, sprang into action and refused to load the same ships at Le Havre um, in France. From there, the ship headed to the port of Genoa in Italy. Um, inspired by the example of the French activists, the port workers and Italian dock workers um, jumped into action and, and, and shut down the, or refused to load the ship um, again. Uh, an incredible rank and file political collective, including dock workers, um, anti fascists, international solidarity across the city, pushed for the blockade of, of the cargo and, and won um, and, and, and stopped it being loaded altogether. Um, but these tactics effectively bolt blockades or follow the bolt, as, as, as they were um, called, you know obviously didn't start in the 90s, but one of the most famous um, examples was with the Neptune Jade, which wasn't necessarily um, arms being traded, but it was seen to be scab cargo um, that was being moved from uh, Liverpool to the States, to Canada, to Japan, and every dock was met with some form of a, an action or movement um, that eventually meant that it was stopped in its tracks altogether. But most famously, probably, as uh, Stefan commented on after Operation Cast Lead and um, the, the BDS movement in full swing managed to um, blockade the, the Zim shipping line, which was supported by the ILWU um, and the States. Um, really, what started is community activists spread to the dock workers themselves, the unionised and non-unionised dock workers who refused to cross the picket line, and then forced the shipping giant to pull out of the US uh, west coast altogether. Um, 
I don't know if someone has any other information, but I don't think they've came back in the last seven years, which is an amazing feat if you think about the billions of dollars that that that, that um, Israeli um, shipping line would have lost uh, just in the last few years. But these examples show the collective power of workers, obviously. And in, in my biased view, uh, you know, the greatest vessel of change when it comes to disrupting the stranglehold that the arms industry has over the world economy and the economy of post-colonial states. For me, the greatest antidote to the poison of the war industry is workers collectively disrupting it. Um, only workers, through the threat of withdrawing their labour, um, have the tangible power to actually force the hand of companies um, like Raytheon, like BAE Systems, to actually uh, break that unfettered, undemocratic, murderous link that they have, or power, sorry, that they have with over nation states. And it's really quite shocking, actually, someone who doesn't have a huge knowledge about the, the, the arms trade in Scotland to hear some of the examples that Stefan's given of just how hypocritical this government's been and actually the pretty good job they've done of spinning the idea that there's some sort of progressive um, progressive state or more so than, than any other nation state. But there's, in my view, less altruistic reasons why unions should take their moral obligations with regards to campaigning against armed trade seriously um, because the transnational trade of weapons and exploitation of workers go hand in hand. They're inextricably linked. As Stefan says, you know, the use of arms and riot gear um, to suppress working people in the US or, or, or civil rights movements. We, we have a, a, it's not just an obligation as a movement, you know, we're actually defending our own here. But I think there's a, a final reason why union leaders um, should be more engaged in actively breaking apart those links between post-colonial governments and, and arms dealers um, because it, it matters to the newest generation of workers. Um, I organise hospitality workers and the average age of our member is 23. It's the, it's the, youngest, um, it's the youngest section of the trade union movement. Um, they care about they they care about the arms trade. They they got involved, um, you know, they, they became politicized in the climate strikes. They care passionately about the world around them and, and, and they made the political links between austerity at home and the war abroad, um, enraged by the, the idea that for the last 10, 11 years the NHS has been deprived of um, the money that it needs, but yet we're doubling the amount of money spent on defence. Um, I myself, you know, I'm, I'm ancient compared to people like Emma and the younger activists that are coming through uh, the, the, the hospitality section, but I myself got involved as a trade unionist because of the war in Iraq, because of what happened in, in Gaza. So I think my final plea to those trade union leaders, which is ultimately my, my main... Um, what I want to get out of this event, as well as learn um, a lot more about the arms trade, is, is, is a plea to, to trade union leaders who, frankly, have taken that workerist approach. Um, we need to reach out. It's not only the right thing to do to save millions of working people's lives, but actually it, it will reach out to the newest generation of workers who hitherto now don't see trade unions by and large to be speaking to them as anti-imperialists, as environmentalists, as people who care about the arms trade. But I'll leave it there just now, Emma. That was um, that was brilliant, Brian. Thank you so much. I think um, there, was, there was a lot of, a lot to take in there and I think it's really interesting for within this space for us to actually think about think about these examples of historically workers that have risen up and and made massive changes and that I feel as though sometimes as as a activist within the anti-militarism movement we sometimes shy away from engaging those workers and having them at the heart of the work that we're doing but but as you've made very clear it's the trade union movement as a whole is shifting it's shifting more towards towards looking for a, a better future and actively 
um, making those big changes. So I think I think it's definitely given me and probably a lot of people that are here. I see we've got some people from across the world actually tuning in just now. So um, a lot to think about. And um, I just wanted to remind everybody that obviously we do have the Q&A box. Um, do pop your questions in there and we'll try to get through them all towards the end. Um, great. So for the next section of our panel, we're taking a slightly different approach um, to what you might have seen already this weekend and how we've been going so far and that we'll have um, Kate Nevins and Yasmin Lookman in conversation. So I'll just introduce them both. Um, Kate is a freelance facilitator and researcher with over a decade of working with youth, women and human rights activists in the Middle East, including Yemen. She's a non-staff member of CAT's steering committee, as well as an active volunteer with the CAT Edinburgh Group and a Scottish Green Party candidate in the upcoming election in Scotland. Kate has also worked as a MENA, Middle East and North Africa program manager at Chat Chatham House head of the MENA programme at Safer World and programme director at Amnesty International in Scotland. Speaking with Kate for the next little while will be Yasmin Lookman, who is a British Yemeni activist living and working in Edinburgh. She completed her MSc in International Relations of the Middle East with Arabic in 2019 and researched and wrote her dissertation on the challenges faced by female activists journalists and political leaders in Yemen over the last decade. Yasmin is also a Beyond Borders UNSC Women in Conflict Fellow and I'm very excited to hear the conversation that um, the two of them are going to have over over the next 20 minutes or so. So please Kate and Yasmin take it away. I think we're going to Yasmin first. Hi, thank you so much. Thanks for that introduction, Emma. Um, so yeah, Kate and I will be discussing Yemen predominantly just to connect the dots between what we've sort of already heard about Scotland's complicity in the arms trade um, and the human costs in Yemen. So um, I'll just spend about five minutes just sort of introducing the situation in Yemen um, and then Kate will move more towards um, the arms trade in Scotland and the UK. Uh, so this year and this week, in fact, uh, marks six years of the war in Yemen. It started when the Houthis took over Sana'a in September 2014 and the Saudi airstrike campaign uh, began um, in March 2015. Um, the most sort of up-to-date statistics I could find are uh, that nearly 250,000 Yemenis have been killed, uh, millions have been internally displaced, and 24 million are at risk of famine. Um, and for reference, Scotland's population is just below 5.5 million people. So if you can imagine how big that is, um, that's just for reference. I really, really want to underline that as we've sort of touched on, perhaps touched on in other panels today, Yemenis are being deliberately starved. The Saudis blockade on Yemen's borders have prevented food, medical aid and gas from getting in the country. The Houthis will steal this aid if, if it does do get through and sell it on the black market. And then the prices of essentials such as food, medicine and gas have absolutely skyrocketed so people can't even afford them if they can get in, if they can get past the black market. And public sector workers have gone without salaries for years. This includes doctors and um, medical staff. There's been high levels of explosive violence from all sides. This includes bombing, shelling, snipering of civilians as well, and grave human rights violations from all sides. Um, some of the conflict actors include the Houthi rebels. Um, they terrorize Yemenis, particularly women and prisoners, journalists, and really anyone they view as a threat. Um, there's a de facto Yemeni government as well who are operating out of Saudi Arabia at the moment. Um, they are corrupt, they engage in money laundering and they divert funds and aid. Um, and when I again like to sort of highlight the fact that when Yemenis desperately need aid, when their aid's being cut off, their aid is being embezzled by the de facto government. Um, and finally, the Saudi led coalition, who may know a little bit about, it's um, supported by the US and the UK through arms sales, um, a plethora of Arab states and militaries. Um, and that sort of membership changes um, it has changed over the last six years. The UAE, for example, will say they've pulled out, but they still operate uh, secret prisons as well. 
Um, and sort of as Emma said, I have I my sort of focus is on Yemeni women um, activists, journalists, uh, leaders. Um, I want to sort of add that Yemen has always been quite a tough place to be a woman, but gender based violence has increased because of the upheaval due to the war. Some of the sort of more recent developments um, that you may have seen in the news um, are that the US has halted arms sales temporarily um, to Saudi Arabia and has started to talk about increasing aid to Yemen, but there is a narrative of Saudi Arabia defending itself um, and that, ex that still exists and that potentially could hint that arms sales may resume in the future. It's not sort of a complete promise. Again, you might have seen sort of more closer to home, um, the UK has slashed aid to Yemen um, at the beginning of March from 164 million pounds last year to 87 million pounds this year. That takes a massive toll on Yemenis who rely on the aid to survive. Um, finally, the COVID pandemic has taken a significant death on Yemenis. The numbers are not clear, but Yemen already had such a limited healthcare infrastructure um, and, and like I said, with uh, healthcare workers going without salaries, um, hospitals have been bombed as well. There are multiple epidemics of cholera and diphtheria ravaging the population, and this just absolutely does not help. Um, and finally, the UK is continuing to supply arms, which is where I will pass on to Kate to go more into depth. Thank you so much, Yasmin. I apologize, everyone. I've got a surprising amount of sunshine coming through my window for Scotland. <laughs> So hopefully you can still see my face. Um, so this it's been a really, really devastating war. We really can't overstate that. What Yasmin has described has been horrific. Um, and throughout the war, the UK government has not only continued selling weapons to some of the main conflict actors, Saudi and UAE, it's actually increased the numbers of exports of weapons that we sell to these countries. So we think... Um, so we know that the UK government has licensed almost seven billion uh, pounds worth of weapons to Saudi since the war began, but that's actually just, just the the licenses that we know about. There's also an open licensing system, which means that the value is probably closer to something like sixteen billion worth. The kinds of things that the UK government has been selling uh, throughout the war are missiles, bombs, and grenades, and also uh, aircrafts, so fighter jets, uh, helicopters and drones. And in addition to the weapons that the government, the UK government has been selling, we, uh, the UK government is also providing technical support uh, by providing staff from BAE systems to support the Saudi Air Force. And these aircrafts and bombs and technical support, they've been used by the Saudis and the UAE and others in a brutal air campaign, which has seen widespread and systematic attacks on civilian targets and huge numbers of violations of international humanitarian law and human rights. So there were points during the war where there was an airstrike by the Saudis every 100 minutes um, and these were hitting more non-military or civilian targets than military ones. So we're talking airstrikes that have been hitting hospitals, like Yasmin says, uh, markets, funerals, weddings, schools, school buses, and key civilian infrastructure like roads and bridges, food storage and factories, which is helping to starve the population. Um, whole cities have been designated targets by the Saudi coalition, um, and so, which is complete violation of international humanitarian law. And they drop leaflets an hour before they bomb, uh, and they drop leaflets primarily to illiterate populations uh, and to populations that don't have any fuel to leave their, their city. Um, there's also one of the things that, so I've worked on Yemen for about 12 years now, um, and one of the things that I still find completely heart-wrenching is um, there's a lot of talk about Saudis indiscriminately bombing, but actually they're targeting civilians. Uh, and one of the things that they do uh, is they do something called double tapping. I'm really sorry, anyone who's upset by this. Um, so what they'll do is they'll bomb a hospital, a school, a factory, and they'll wait for the rescue, the, the informal rescue teams to come and try and rescue people, and then they'll bomb the same target again, um, at killing the rescue teams and killing anyone that might have survived the first bombing. Um, some of you may have heard, there's a few of these bombings have sort of made international news. There was a massive bombing of a funeral, um, and that funeral bombing that killed over 100 
people. Uh, that happened just two months after the UK government provided training on international humanitarian law to the Saudis. So while um, the government and the arms companies deliberately make it really difficult to determine exactly where in the UK weapons have been made, it's certain that parts of bombs and aircraft being used by the Saudis have been made here in Scotland. Um, so as Stefan mentioned, um, Fragments of Raytheon Paveway smart bombs um, are be, uh, have been found in uh, bombing sites that bomb family homes, uh, bombing sites uh, that, of markets, and also of warehouses and factories. And these fragments can be traced back to the Fife, uh, the Fife factory uh, of Raytheon. Um, we also know that Saudis have been uh, using Eurofighter typhoons which we know rely on radar systems uh, manufactured on the east coast of Scotland uh, and infrared targeting tracking devices made on the west coast. We also know that at least 16 companies operating in arms companies operating in Scotland have applied for military export licenses to Saudi coalition members uh, since 2008. So this is, this is coming from Scotland. Um, it's not looking like the UK will stop their support to the Saudi campaign anytime soon. Um, right from the outset of the bombing in, of Yemen, the foreign secretary at the time, he said, we will support the Saudis in every practical way possible, short of engaging in combat. And that's exactly what they continue to do. And they continue to uh, put weapons into, uh, into uh, a situation where there's growing evidence of war crimes. And actually, they're increasing that support. Um, as Stefan mentioned, the SNP, the ruling party here in Scotland, their MPs in Westminster have been really vocal and really supportive um, against UK sales to Saudi. But the SNP government here in Scotland continue to provide huge amounts of support to the same arms manufacturers uh, that are supplying weapons into the Yemen war. Uh, so, as Stefan mentioned, Scottish Enterprise is giving millions of uh, pounds of public money uh, to these arms companies, including to Leonardo BAE Systems and Raytheon. Um, and also the Scottish Parliament and government ministers are welcoming with pretty much open arms, uh, arms manufacturers in, into Parliament. So there's been uh, numerous meetings with ministers between so SNP ministers, government ministers, uh, with arms companies and also multiple lobbying meetings with other parliamentarians. Uh, so we've got a massive hypocrisy uh, happening here in Scotland. Um, and over to Yasmin, who's going to tell us a little bit about what, what are Yemeni activists doing? Thanks so much, Kate. So we can really look at sort of the different ways that people are resisting um, both Yemeni and non-Yemeni and people in Yemen and people not in Yemen as well. Um, at the moment, a lot of sort of activism is taking place online. Um, so activists are making um, use of sort of the online spaces to campaign and share information in panel discussions, much like this, um, and in social media campaigns. So one of the more recent um, events was the Yemen Day of Rage on the 25th of January this year, um, where there was loads of online action and um, in-person protests globally. Um, Clubhouse is also a, um, an app that's being used as a space to sort of informally discuss activism. Um, and this actually reminded me, I added this to my notes after attending the event last night, but um, it, there's similar sort of sentiments to Arabs who were organizing over Twitter during the Arab Spring, um, and sort of using that um, as a place to share like citizen journalism. Um, so I thought that was quite interesting. Um, I would like to underline the need for Yemeni activists to lead the organize or to, to lead the yeah organizing and lead the conversation because ultimately it is Yemenis that should decide the future of Yemen. Um, it is nice to have hope, high profile figures um, speak on Yemen. One example is Jeremy Corbyn will speak quite a lot. He's great. I appreciate seeing that and I appreciate seeing his enthusiasm. Um, and we do need strong allies but it really is important to listen to and elevate Yemeni voices, especially women and the youth um, who know their country well and they know what their country needs. 
Um, and particularly when they are being overlooked by white men making the, the decisions, um, one of which is the special envoy, um, Martin Griffiths, um, who tends to be at the forefront of these conversations and making those decisions. Um, activists, both in Yemen and outside of Yemen, are calling on governments to cease arms sales um, and hold the armed factions accountable for their war crimes. Uh, Yemeni activists in the UK are actually not just discussing the war, we're uplifting stories, music, and art, which really helps to, sh like, to show that, um, that Yemen is not just a place of war and violence and poverty. It is a vibrant place, and it, it shows that Yemenis are incredibly resilient. Um, in Scotland in particular, um, diaspora communities do fundraise for specific causes um, and create opportunities for Yemenis in Scotland to connect. Um, one of which that I'm aware of is to Yemen with love. Um, that, so do look that up if, if you have the chance. Um, in Yemen, um, women peace builders have been hard at work. Um, they've been hard at work when their work has not been sort of highlighted by the media. Um, some of the sort of um, small or, uh, smaller actions that do sort of contribute to the overall effort are working like so working with the youth um, to prevent them from joining the armed forces, um, providing food and water aid, um, including things like building water stations in areas that don't have access to clean water, um, helping to rebuild schools and getting children back into education, particularly after these schools have been bombed by the Saudi -led coalition. Um, calling on the international community to work with women peace builders and activists, um, particularly to work towards a gender sensitive peaceful solution. Um, calling for the release of prisoners and detainees and to cease um, the act of kidnapping and abducting. Um, and then calling for gender based violence to cease being used as a tool of war. Um, and as I said, sort of in the intro, um, Yemen does not have a good record for gender equality. It has really been exacerbated by um, the by the war and the chaos that sort of ensued. Um, and then peace activists, both men and women, um, are covering and sharing news of airstrikes in sort of a citizen journalist format on Twitter. Um, and so it is difficult to get news out of Yemen. Um, so this is a really great way to get that. Um, and it tends to be and depending on who sort of is reporting, but sort of the more formal media um, coming out of Yemen is tends to be biased towards one party or another. Um, it's hard to get unbiased news, so we do rely on citizen journalists. Um, and then peace activists are calling on the UN to take more tangible action, not just words, the empty words, um, and recording evidence of human rights abuses committed by the warring parties. So for this final part, I'm just gonna hand this over um, back to Kate, just to discuss the actions that we can get involved in to show solidarity. Great, um, thank you so much, Yasmin. That really captures like a really like sense of how much is happening on the ground in Yemen and how we don't, we don't talk about that. There's so much peace activism happening in Yemen uh, with women and youth and civil society groups and human rights groups. And we really need to uh, build those relationships and support and provide solidarity where we can. Um, here in Scotland, there's a sense, uh, Stefan mentioned it, there's a, there's a sense that at least the, the public are in a slightly different uh, place than other, uh, other audiences, I guess, in, in the UK. And there, is, there, there was a poll a couple of years ago that suggested that um, the Scottish public are significantly opposed to arms exports to Saudi. And that's really something that we can try and build on, but also turn this kind of public support into tangible change here in Scotland. So although decisions relating to arms exports are reserved to Westminster, there are actually a lot of levers that we have here in Scotland and a lot of things that we can do from here. Uh, both in terms of whilst we remain part of the UK and if at one point uh, Scotland becomes an independent country. Um, we have an election coming up. <laughs> it's a rather obvious point, but uh, on the 6th of May, we'll be going to the polls uh, either. <laughs> Probably most of us will be posting our vote um, uh, and we will be electing a new parliament. So we can push I'm one of those candidates, but I will still be pushing the other candidates in my area uh, to um, make commitments around 
not just arms exports uh, to around like that they can apply pressure on Westminster, but to make commitments around reviewing the policies and priorities of our public funds, those Scottish enterprise funds, pushing parties to commit uh, to ending public funds to arms companies, uh, and also pushing uh, what will be a new government uh, to start thinking really seriously about that jobs transition, that transition from jobs in arms manufacturing and supporting that transition for workers into renewable energy. So there's a really strong case that a lot, if not all of the workers that work in arms manufacturing here in Scotland could work in renewable energy in uh, tidal and, and wind energy in particular. Um, another thing we can all do as individuals, any of us who has a pension, we should check, particularly if we're a public sector worker, if we're nurses and teachers, bus drivers, um, check where our pensions are invested and push our pension fund to divest uh, from arms companies. Uh, if we are parents, if we have children at school or uh, if we're at universities ourselves or have children at universities, um, we can also look at the role uh, that arms companies are playing in our schools. So ask the parent teacher councils, are there arms companies coming in and doing STEM education with our children? Do we want someone else to be doing that? Uh, are they coming and doing recruitment fairs in the universities or in uh, high schools or colleges? Um, we can get involved in our local group of cat. So Scotland has some of the most active uh, local, I'm, I'm biased, but we have like the best groups in the UK by a long way. Uh, so come along to our, uh, like our meetings. We're really lovely, I promise. Like uh, we get up to really, really good stuff. So that um, underwater defense technology arms fair that Stefan mentioned in Glasgow, we shut that down. Like that's not gonna happen again. And that was just a little group of uh, uh, peace activists here in Scotland. Um, and finally, just to reiterate Yasmin's point about seeking out opportunities to listen to Yemeni activists, to be led in our campaigning by Yemeni activists um, and Syrian activists and Palestinian activists and all of the, uh, the uh, places which are horribly affected by weapons um, and seek to build relationships and solidarity. Um, and to support the people that are documenting these human rights abuses at a lot of risk, and also the people that are providing community support. Um, and just to end on, we also need to recognise as uh, British activists that um, the, we don't necessarily totally understand what is happening in these complex uh, conflicts around the world and that there are a plurality of views and we need to make sure that there's space for a plurality of Yemeni views or Palestinian views or Syrian views when we talk about the conflict and not not everyone will have the same stance um, on the arms trade and that needs to be a, that needs to be a conversation. That was um, that was absolutely brilliant, Kate and Yasmin. Thank you so much. I think um, there was a lot of a lot of different points to digest there. Apologies, um, but I think I think from all of the speakers that we've had this afternoon, the the clear stream of hypocrisy from from how we're perceived, how the Scottish Parliament is perceived, and in their actual actions, um, it's just it's, it's throughout every single area that we've looked at. Um, so we are nearing towards the end of the day, not the end of this session. Um, everyone will probably be uh, definitely suffering from, from Zoom fatigue, shall we say. So I'm going to um, call for a little five minute break just now. Um, there's so much to learn in these spaces. We've had a couple of questions in the Q&A boxes already, um, but obviously the rest of our session when we come back at quarter past five will be just Q&A. So feel free to leave any thoughts or let that settle in and um, get involved in the, the Q&A section. So I'll see you back here at quarter past five. Thank you so much. Okay, great. So we are just coming back just now. Um, what we, I hope you had a chance to, to stand up and stretch a little bit, or at least at least look away from the computer screen. But um, we've had a couple of questions in. I will um, make a start with a question for Yasmin, um, and it's from Melanie. And Melanie has asked, how can we best support Yemeni activists now in Scotland? So 
Yasmin, I'll let you take over on that. Right, that's a really good question. Uh, thank you, Melanie. Um, the I think there are a few good ways to support Yemeni activists now. Um, one of the sort of major ways is um, to share and uplift their work. Um, oftentimes that sort of, that gets buried underneath the major sort of players um, who have a voice and we don't want their voice to sort of go amiss. Um, and in particular, it's uh, donating and supporting smaller women-led organizations as well. Um, I think that like they tend to really be the ones to get stuff done, not saying that anything against sort of the bigger NGOs, um, but in particular because they have such technical uh, knowledge of, of the areas that they work in and what people there need. Um, so that was another good way. Um, from, I, I think maybe sort of from here, um, giving them opportunities to um, speak on panels like this and to, and to speak at events. Um, again, that sort of brings that really key information. Um, and then finally, sort of my favorite thing to do, my MP is heard probably for me weekly, um, but writing to your elected officials um, and with that sort of knowledge of, of what's happening in Yemen, um, you can really make a difference. That's brilliant. Thank you. Yes, and Melanie, I hope that answers your question. I hope it definitely has given everybody some some thoughts about what, what we can be doing just now um, to show solidarity and move, as I said earlier, moving away from that, that idea um, of sympathy. So we have another question, um, which I'll direct towards Stefan, which is, which companies are involved in the supply chain to arms manufacturers? Because obviously we know it's not just the, it's not just the, the person that's export, the company that's exporting um, the arms, it's, it's there's a whole bunch of building blocks and um, different companies that are involved in that. So, Stefan, are you okay to come in on that? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's there's lots, um, uh, probably too many to list right now. Um, but there's there's dozens. Of, I mean, we identified at least um, at least ninety companies involved in the arms trade supply in Scotland. Um, and that varies from um, companies that are very involved to companies that just supply, like Plexus, for example, is a major supplier to Thales. It does a lot of things, but it's a major supplier to the arms industry, despite not really producing the products itself. Um, and there's loads of companies that are mostly civilian, but also have military applications like there's countless companies up in the north of Scotland as well companies like Copper Nix Technology and that, that have big socially useful manufacturing sites like they do a lot for example in renewable energy and areas like that but they also have significant areas which is supplied to the arms trade so I mean Pretty much every council area in Scotland has companies that produce into it. So it's 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 a big it's a big web. Um, and there's companies like Spirit Aerospace, which are leading the civilian aerospace area in Scotland, but are now actually being encouraged by ADS and other groups to move into the defence area. So it, it does it changes, but um, but yeah, I'm sure if I can. I'm sure it'll be something on the CAT website, but we put, we can make sure we put together a list for you so we can see. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. If um, any of the other panellists want to come in on any of the questions, just um, please feel free to go into it. Um, so we've got another question that I'll, I'll direct towards Kate, um, which is, are MSPs, and also others can jump in, are MSPs being lobbied by companies in their own constituency or nationally? What's in it for the MSP? Because obviously, um, Kate, you'd mentioned and um, Stefan had mentioned as well about um, the sort of the, the other level of support outside of just the funding of um, the facilitation of these relationships. So, yeah, yeah I'll um, throw that out there. I get the imp uh, Stefan probably knows a little bit more about some of the meetings that have been happening as well, but um, I, might get, I get the impression it's both. Um, so I've been at party conferences as an activist rather than as a party member. Um, 
as a like third sector person, uh, where you've got your arms companies literally drinking whiskey, buying whiskey for uh, the the MSPs or wannabe MSPs uh, in the biggest in the bigger parties, um, trying to win essentially just win favour. So that's national contracts. I think they're looking for. Uh, there, so you've got a lot of lobbying of ministers around yeah, na national contracts, and um, but you also have uh, arms companies going to local government, and I think that's overlooked. So you have arms companies going to local government to our local councillors, uh, selling themselves as a, a really good employer in the local area, um, as uh, often on gender grounds of like let's get more young women into STEM. Um, and why arms companies given <laughs> think they're any good at getting women into STEM? I have no idea because they're very, it's very much jobs for men uh, in the arms manufacturing at the moment. Um, but yeah, so you're, you're talking about um, going towards going to local governments, going to constituency MSPs about local issues, and going to ministers for na not national contracts, but to talk about what uh, the companies are doing nationally. I don't know, Stefan, if you have any more information on some of those, like it's, it's private meetings, right? So we, yeah. Uh, you're on mute, Stefan. Sorry. Yeah, no, uh, I mean, Kate's completely right there. Um, the private meetings and each will be different, but I mean, there's some like, as you say, it's in different places, like in the lobbying register, when it's companies lobbying, they need to put a little bit of information in about it. And for example, like, you know, the BAE met Ivan McKee at a business awards ceremony and they lobbied him directly about BAE increasing their export potential from Scotland because they divulged that. But um, so it can happen both ways. Um, when Paul Wheelhouse visited the Raytheon factory in 2018, for example, that was asked for by Raytheon, but facilitated by Scottish Defence, not no, Scottish Development International, which is like an arm's length governmental body like Scottish Enterprise. So it's really intertwined and it's really structural within the Scottish government, you know. Um, so it's not so much the MSPs in a lot of ways, because I know from conversations people have had and hearing them speak that there might not be supporters of the arms trade but it's almost like it's almost part of the duty to engage with that industry um but i think a lot of it is especially with public means it's the arms trade wanting kind of public approval from the scottish government emma do you mind if i come in on this as well um Go for it, yeah. i have nowhere near the the knowledge that, that people like Kate and, and Stefan have on the specifics with Scottish Government. I just know from experience of not being consulted uh, as a trade unionist on, you know, matters that, that should matter to workers, i.e. constituents. This is the main issue uh, with lobbying in general, particularly with the arms trade, particularly how insidious it is, is that the Scottish Government, despite its rhetoric, uh, and specific MSPs um, themselves, some being worse than others, are perfectly happy with being lobbied directly, in my view, and I don't want to get pursued for defamation here, but in my view, to a level of corruption, where they're actually actively uh, drawing up, as some people have said, contracts as a direct result of receiving something. That should not, it's certainly not morally acceptable, it shouldn't be it shouldn't be legal. But certainly from a, a trade union perspective, when we try and engage with Scottish government ministers, UK government ministers, about the loss of 650,000 jobs in the hospitality industry, they don't want to know. They, 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 they don't want to meet us about the, the mass job losses and, and destitution of their own constituents. And yet they're happy to meet Raytheon and, and so on I don't want to go too much into the kind of, um, shall we say, the kind of uh, sociopathic nature of some uh, politicians, but I think it just speaks to the kind of really overt capitalist nature of political discourse that, that elected politicians think it's acceptable to meet with uh, 
arms dealers as opposed to people who represent thousands of their constituents. I just find that absolutely um, mind blown, to be honest. That's brilliant. Thanks. Yeah, I think that was uh, across across the three speakers there. I think that was uh, a really comprehensive answer to that question. Um, Brian, actually, the next question was was also towards you, and that was um, how could we how how can we as activists um, approach trade unions? Um, obviously, part of that is being within a trade union, being part of it, and make that change from within. But there's sometimes this idea that 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 we are working against them, that we just want rid of these jobs. So how, how do you see, and I, I noticed that you'd answered the question partially in the box, is how can we make the change from, from within as, as anti-militarist peace activists? Well, well, I think first and foremost, unions are democratic bodies. They should listen to the majority of their uh, members. So what that means in theory is that we should be able to, as peace activists, um, with full engagement, you know, there doesn't need to be a confrontation with those defence workers. With full engagement with those um, defence workers and the radical ed education that comes with those discussions and that kind of um, discourse, we need to unify the democratic structures of that union in order to uh, change the policies of the unions. Um, I'm going to be honest and say my union doesn't have the best, in my view, from my personal capacity view, doesn't have the best policies when it comes to when it comes to the arms trade. But those policies have came a hell of a long way in the last 10 years. Um, things like Just Transition, which again, I'm not claiming is perfect. Things like the Green Industrial Revolution have have came out, have, have came out of uh, years of conferences in democratic structures where peace activists, some of whom are in the defence industry, have moved the leadership of the unions, have, have forced the leadership of the unions to take heed of what has been said around defence and ar around defence and around our connection with the arms trade. So if you just look at the pensions, um, the ethical pension funds that, that Kate was talking about earlier. Unite, Unison, the biggest unions in the country used to be huge um, investors to, to the tune of billions of pounds in these um, pension funds that were repugnant, completely connected to the arms trade. Um, my understanding is that's moved, certainly the rhetoric or the, the um, consensus has moved away from them almost entirely. Um, and that is as a direct result of workers, including defence workers, actually democratically moving their entire union with them. So I think that's 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 all you know. That's all you, you can do. To, well, I'm not saying you. There will obviously be a point at which we come to confrontation with the leadership of the union that disagree with you on that because they see themselves to be managing decline. Put it that way. There's a there's a connection between those who think we should organise new workforces um, and those who think we should uh, change the perspectives of the old industries. Um, but it's about using those democratic structures and actually holding the leadership of, of those organisations to account. Yeah, no, I think um, you're you're spot on with that. And there's also the it's been covered already this weekend. But there's that idea of um, no matter what industry it is that we're that we're working in, we can we can join the relevant trade union. We can make sure that things like um, like as you said, said Brian, our pensions and um, our policies are in line. So, for example, there are organisations that work um, around that. So we're looking at, for example, scientists for global responsibility. They do a lot of great work um, in the with trade unions as well around that. Um, so I'm going to look at the, the next question, which um, is is towards Kate, but I know, Yasmin, you've been working on this as well. And the question is, um, in the event that the, the SNP fall short of a majority and look to work with um, the Scottish Greens, what pressure um, will be put on them to clamp down on arms sales? And obviously that's coming a question like as the Scottish Greens, but also we need to think about how can we work with um, the other parties to make sure that that pressure is continuous. So um, Yasmin um, and Kate. 
sure should I do that as cat I'll put my I don't actually have a green hat I need a physical green hat uh with my green party Scottish Green Party candidate hat on um uh <laughs> obviously fairly biased here um so the Scottish Greens we have the uh most stringent uh policies on arms control arms export and arms control of all of the parties um we think that uh all the international arms trade is uh morally wrong uh, and would seek if uh we would seek to end all support all scottish government support to arms companies uh technical support and financial support um the the balance of power issue so we're probably looking at an SNP majority. Um, maybe we're not. It's really important that we try not to have an SNP majority so that the opposition parties can hold the SNP government to account uh, more easily. Um, the Greens vote against the SNP on a lot of their economic policies a lot of the time, uh, and we will continue to push them. I would say that as um, an opposition party, uh, in the last session, we've been doing an awful lot as Greens. So a lot of the information that we have on uh, the public funds investments are from freedom of information requests put in by the Greens. Um, we've also, I believe, secured commitments um, uh, around new rules for Scottish public bodies to conduct human rights checks on companies, including arms companies, prior to funding them. So that's, that's already happened. So we'd be looking to continue that kind of uh, pressure on an SNP majority. If they if, if they do get a majority, but hopefully that pressure, that lever is, is higher for all opposition parties if the SNP don't hold a majority government. It's a bit political of an answer. I don't know. I'm getting into the <laughs> getting into the hard things now. Um, but yeah, uh, vote green. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I think just the example of that though, as I'd said, sort of imposing the question, it's how can we place pressure on all the all the uh, opposition parties and moving forward and obviously that'll be a big a big step as we're moving into a new Scottish Parliament and as activists in Scotland how are we going to see the next five years playing out yeah it's um, worth noting that four of the five main political parties in Scotland are committed to ending arms exports to Saudi and it's just about them pressurizing all of those government uh, all of those parties as everyone except the Conservatives um, so it's Labour, Scottish Labour, Scottish Lib Dems, SM, SNP and Greens. Um, we're all committed to ending exports to human rights abusing countries, essentially, uh, but currently that's a reserved topic. So what we need to do is convert the Scottish political parties into doing stuff in Scotland in the same spirit, which other parties are currently not committed to. Uh, so we need to be pushing pressure on all of the political parties. Um, to be thinking about diverse, de defence diversification, things that they can do in Scotland that's not just saying, oh yeah, we don't want the horrible UK government to continue selling arms, we will actually do something here in Scotland. That's great, thank you. Um, Yasmin, I wasn't sure if you wanted to come in on that, if you had anything else to say around how we can maybe keep up the pressure yeah, as we move into a new um, Scottish Parliament and new Scottish Government. No, I think Kate did a really good job of covering it. Um, the only other thing that I might add that's sort of relevant, I guess, is that we have council elections next year um, and pressure needs to be put on councillors to, um, in particular in Edinburgh, is that, that's where my knowledge is at, um, to divest from arms um, companies in their pensions, I think. It need, like the pressure needs to be at all levels, um, not just at Holyrood. Um, but yeah, I think Kate did a fantastic job covering it. So nothing further to add for me. Yeah, that's um, that's brilliant to make a really good point because we, as we look ahead to the council elections next year, we look at um, the Strathclyde Pension Fund, which is which covers a lot of different councils in the central belt of Scotland. I, I believe it's the largest pension fund in the UK, one of the largest. And the fact that they are still importing millions um, into investing in, in arms manufacturers across the board and within the, within the councils now we're starting to see in pushback on that so though there is a lot of work to do on that on the sort of different levels of um, local government as well um, so we are we do only have about 10 minutes left I'm going to answer I'm going to ask this last question um, it's coming and I'll, I'll direct this towards Stefan which is um, is the French company Circle um, who run our ferries still and still in the arms trades um, and obviously we know Circle have many different branches and, and are horrendous in a 
um, plethora of ways, but um, thinking about still in the arm trade and just answering that question, Stephanie. Um, yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. Um, not so much the arms trade as kind of domestic arms. Um, I think they're involved in Australia as well, so you could say trade. But um, I know that until very recently they were one of the major players in the atomics weapons establishment, which makes the nuclear warheads. And I know they have a presence at Faslane as well, so they're very much involved in the defence industry. Um, and I'd say quickly, just as a non-Green member, I agree with everything that Kate said and Yasmin as well. I think he was very right, but I'd say there's limitations to electoral politics for the arms trade as well, because like, for example, the Greens had this, they were the, because they currently basically prop up the SNP administration just now, and managed to win a lot of good concessions before the budget. But like, there was nothing on, for example, Scottish enterprise investment, as far as I'm aware, and I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing because I think with elections, it's like about everything, you know, so it covers such a broad range that unfortunately the arms industry falls pretty low down on the scale of what affects people's lives here. But I think, but I think the pressure needs to be put on and, and Kate's totally right to say that hold the, com the, hold the par parties, especially that make those commitments to account. But yeah, sorry, back to the question, Circle's still involved, yeah. <laughs> No problem at all. I think we, we like to see a big uh, a roundup. Um, and speaking of which, I think um, I will po I'll pose this um, question to each of our um, panellists today. And first of all, if you had any sort of closing remarks or anything like that, but then also if there was one thing, and obviously it's different if we were in a, in a group setting rather than a webinar, um, what's one thing that as panellists you'll be taking away from, from this? I just thought I'd pose a question in a slightly different way. Um, we'll maybe start with um, Brian. I would like to uh, propose that I'm probably the panellist who's learned the most in this uh, session. Um, just because I'm a peace activist, I've, I've not researched it anywhere near as much as I should have as, as a trade unionist. Um, but certainly one thing I'll take away from today's session is 90 companies in Scotland engaged directly in the arms trade or who have been given contracts, that blows my mind. Um, I wasn't under any illusions about Scotland being, or the Scottish government being some sort of progressive, um, you know, bastion of anti-arms trade, but I did not think it was that bad and that prolific. Um, so that will be one kind of angering piece of research that I will take from today. That's great. And we'll move on to Yasmin. I think um, I'll probably um, throw it back at Brian and say I want to learn. I learned a bit about sort of the role of um, trade unionists um, and the power of the worker um, as an anti-capitalist and as, as a socialist. I already really um, understand the, the role of the worker and um, and um, in uniting against sort of a common enemy. Um, but I have, I've sort of, I don't know if I've neglected that sort of in my research so far, but it's something definitely um, to take away from the session um, and reflect a bit more. And um, Stefan, did you want to come in next? Um, yeah, yeah, um, I, I, I agree. Um, I agree with Yasmin as well. I think, I think Brian's, um, kind of contributions were really interesting and it's obviously something to think about but it's interesting to get the kind of all the all the examples in one place and kind of realize that there is that kind of collective there and I also think what Yasmin and Kate were saying as well about kind of stressing the importance of groups on the ground I think I forget that as well you know because you're here and you basically just go to the information that's accessible or do the things you see here and you kind of forget to really look for peace building groups on the ground in places like Yemen who actually are there implementing things so I think that's like a pretty important takeaway. And then last but obviously not least we've got Kate. Yeah, I think um, similar to Yasmin, I took away a lot about like that history of worker politics um, and uh, like the fact that there really are 
uh, people in trade unions that have a history of um, activism, uh, then we'll st they'll still be there, some of them that had, were activists against apartheid, against um, uh, Chilean di dictatorships and like building those, building those bridges and building those bridges also um, between um, in countries like Egypt, where there's huge amounts of trade union activism that's very underground right now because it's incredibly dangerous and how you can build uh, relationships between between those groups. Brilliant. That was um, that's good. It's some of those things that were even said just re -jog jogged my memory of things that we spoke about. I feel like we've covered so much and um, you know, the different areas, a couple of people had said in the in the chat discussion that, you know, the different areas that we've covered today and different ways in which, as I said in the beginning, that, that Scotland is an active participant in, um, in the UK's warmongering, for want of a better word. 